it has to be said, I feel very warmly welcomed here and thank you very much for, for this. This is amazing to see people coming from so many different places to hear the Word of God. And it shows me that um, the church is not dying, but the church is starving. And there's very few places around the world where churches teach Bible. Very few. And trust me, I'm not invited to churches that don't teach Bible normally. Um, so this is great. And, and the title of the message, as you can see on the screen, The Days of Ezekiel. I believe that too many people are assuming upon themselves the title prophets. I, by the way, come from a non-profit organization. <laughs> I believe that going to a school of prophets will not make you a prophet. I believe that um, um, thinking that you know better will not still make you a prophet. I believe that if you want to be a prophet, you're probably not the right person. I believe with all of my heart that the office of a prophet is something that only God can appoint someone to, to be, and it, it is uh, quite amazing. And prophets in the history of Israel were not that popular. Nowadays, if you want to do well online, just call yourself prophet. And people will invite you to all conferences and prophet this, prophet that. I mean, in those days, if you called yourself a prophet, you probably risked your life. Because what you had to say was not that popular. And um, in fact, Jesus himself said, Jerusalem, who, who killed her prophets. I mean, that's what the faith of, 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 uh, of the prophets in those days. Yet, we must understand that God raised those prophets for all of us to show His mercy, grace, and faithfulness. Why? Think about it. The children of Israel, until their exodus from Egypt, were not really a nation yet. And they had no God and no hope in this world. They were really like strangers to God. In a sense, you really think about it. When Moses was called to go to Pharaoh and to go to the children of Israel, he actually asked God, excuse me, can you tell me what your name is? Because I, I need to tell them who sent me. They don't even know your name. They don't know who you are. They've been there for 400 years. They've been enslaved by the Egyptians. It's not a nation that knows you. So I need to introduce you to them. And we need to work on this. So who are you? What's your name? I am who I am, the Lord said, if you remember that. But if you understand, up until that point, there was no promise there was nothing. If you really think about it, God did not start the Hebrew calendar anywhere before the exodus from Egypt. The first event that marks the first month of the, first, uh, of the, of the Hebrew calendar is what? Passover. The actual day they came out of Egypt. That's it. From this moment on, I want you to be my people as a nation, I will be your God. I'm going to give you the word of God. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to walk with you and show you the way. I'm going to lead you into your promised land. Amazing. So we didn't really have prophets, if you really think about it, until Israel became a nation. And that's when we had um, the amazing journey of God with his people. So God decided, okay, from this moment on, I, want, I will promise you some things and I want you, you can actually test me and see if I'm serious or not about those things. And he raised the prophets to do that, actually. And it's very interesting, Isaiah chapter 46, one of my favorite um, 
chapters, verses 9 and 10 says, Remember this and show yourself many. Then he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. The Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, listen, I'm not hiding my plans from you. I declare the end from the beginning. If you want to know the end, listen to me. Through my prophets, I'm going to reveal that. You know that walking in the streets of New York City, do you know how many psychic shops you can find there? And how busy they are. And they're in every street corner. You know why? Because people want to know the future. It's just that they don't understand. The future is all here. I always tell people, look, I could have told you. (laughs) So many things that happen along the history. If I lived in the 1800s, I could have told you that Israel is coming back to their land. I could have told you that they're going to prosper. I could have, I mean, so much is happening before our very eyes. We don't need to be surprised. We, the Christian individuals, we have more knowledge of the future and understanding of what's going on in the world than the top secret service of any country around the world. Hmm. And we're going to talk about it tonight. <laughs> Second Peter, for those of you who think of going to the school of prophets. Second Peter says in chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. You see? All those who want to be prophets. It's not about you and your will. For holy men of God spoke. Yes, God used them. But as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so so many people are telling me, well, that's good for the Old Testament. But we are Christians and we believe in the New Testament. So Jesus came and that's no longer valid. Really? Well, let me tell you a secret, okay? Don't tell anyone I said that. Jesus never preached from the New Testament even once. (laughs) In the first century, no one read the New Testament. All the people that got saved and baptized were baptized and got saved earlier before they got baptized. Some of them just by reading Isaiah. At least the Ethiopian eunuch. He only read one book. And it was enough to understand. Okay, 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 I understand. What's going to stop me from being baptized? Ah, did you go to seminary? (laughs) Do you want to go through the course of what? uh, I mean, uh, nothing. Let's stop. They stop. He was baptized. And then the first rapture ever happened. Ooh. The word harpazo in Greek appears for the first time in the New Testament. Where? When Philip took the Ethiopians into the water. And when the Ethiopian came out of the water, Philip was gone. <laughs> Rapture. Now, some raptures are vertically, some are horizontally. <laughs> So that was a horizontal one. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, in Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews wrote this regarding Jesus and the prophet. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, 
In other words, the same God who spoke to the fathers in ancient times through the prophets, in these last days is speaking to us also through his son. So the term the last days actually belongs to the point that Jesus came to the world. From that moment on, the last days started. And that's why I call my book The Last Hour. I believe, beloved, the Bible says in 1 John, we're, this is the last hour. Jesus came to already fulfill all that was spoken by the prophets. So, you can imagine the people at his time. Wow. Not too many, by the way, were so excited. Very few. The rest of them were like, ooh, nice miracle. Let's see you do this now. <laughs> nice. Let's see you do this now. Okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, he's dead. <sighs> and they go to see the tomb, and the tomb is empty. And the angel says, he's not here, he's alive. Really? Hmm. And then they go home like that. They, <laughs> they read the scriptures, but they didn't believe in them. And Jesus said to the two disciples who went to Emmaus, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, to believe that which this, the prophets have spoken. So Bible prophecy is super important because the prophets spoke, Jesus came and fulfilled, and the plans of God are beautifully outlined here. And we're in the year 2018, and in a very interesting way, the prophet Ezekiel is more accurate today than your daily newspaper. So what are the days of Ezekiel? We are a generation. We are the generation that is not just studying Ezekiel. Not just reading Ezekiel. We are the generation that lives through the days of Ezekiel. You know, in, in chapter 36, the prophet Ezekiel says, But you, O mountains of Israel, the land was so dead when, when the first Jews returned back Mark Twain shows up in the mid-1800s and he writes a, a, a diary. This is what the, the land looked like. Dry, dead. And, and he wrote in his diary, not even a single soul we saw there living. Even cactuses are not growing there. It was that bad. The Bible says... That Moses already said that when the people of Israel are not going to be faithful and God will take them out of the land, the land will be such a barren wasteland and strangers and Gentiles will come and testify of how the land is barren. And sure, sure enough, Mark Twain shows up and, and write about this. Look at this. Horrible. And the Jews that came back to the land in little and small numbers were the pioneers. I want you to know that um, they fought the malaria, the mosquitoes, the Anopheles mosquitoes. That was, it was horrible. Many of them died. But then God, by his grace, because he's sovereign, decided, I'm about to make the most amazing move since the time of Jesus. And the move that I'm about to do is a move not because Israel is perfect, but because I want the whole world to know that I am God. So Israel is now being used by God, A, to fulfill his promises to their fathers, B, to show his faithfulness and mercy, and C, because he loves the nation so much, that he wants them to see through Israel his faithfulness. 
So in, in the prophet Ezekiel, in his 36th chapter, we, we, we see how the prophet is basically describing the return of the Jews to the land. First he says in verse 19, I poured out my fury on them. And, and, and then he said, so I scattered them among the nations. And, that, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. He, he basically says, look, they were not following me. They did whatever they wanted. So I scattered them. But then he said, I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord. You see, the Lord says, Look, you Israel, after all I did for you in the desert and in the land and all I, the wars I fought for you, you still didn't really walk with me and, and believed in me. And now, when you go all around the world as people without land, can you imagine how much of a... Of, of a shame it is for me as God. Because everybody will, will say, look at them. The people of God have no land. So look what he says. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned. And he says, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. And I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned. And then he says, When I am hallowed in you before their eyes, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. And in earlier, by the way, he says in verse 8, But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. You see, these people that you see on the screen are pioneers. And God used them to prepare the land for his great move of bringing the nation of Israel back to the land. How can they sustain themselves in such a dead land? So God commanded the land to be fruitful and bang, look what happened. Israel has today a capacity not only to, to supply all of our needs food-wise, but we're actually exporting. Look at this. Is that the work of men? No. Because for hundreds of years the land was dead. So it's very interesting. God says, I'm about to bring them back to their land, but first I have to prepare the land. And once the land is ready, I'm going to bring them. And then he moved to chapter 37. One of the most amazing chapters. Where Ezekiel was brought down to a valley full of dry bones. And Ezekiel says, Lord, what is it? And the Lord says, These are the entire house of Israel. They say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves have been cut off. And I remember, for the longest time, being a, a grandson of Holocaust survivors, I was trying to think, what is the picture that I can have in my mind of the dry bones? Because the dry bones can talk. These are living people with no flesh, just bones and skin. And this is the picture that came, go back. Oh, I guess that picture is not there. The picture that came to my mind, just so you know, is this picture of those who were rescued from the death camps. They had no flesh. It was skin and bones. In their eyes, there was no hope at all. They were sure that God has abandoned them. They were sure that there is no more hope. And the Lord said, tell them, Ezekiel, I want you to tell them. 
Say to them, Behold, my people, I will open your graves. In Ezekiel 37, verse 12, I will open my gra- the, the, your graves and I will cause you to come up from your graves and I will bring you into the land of Israel and then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. And I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land which means the land of Israel is their own land. Last time I checked. And then he said, Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Wow. And my grandparents were part of this. The Lord brought them. No nation helped them. Not like today. Everyone who wants to escape gets on the boat. And George Soros is funding everything else. No. In those days, nobody helped. When my grandparents made it to the land of Israel, they saw it. They just... All of their family died. They just saw... My grandma was pregnant. They just saw the land. And the British police stopped them, turned their boat, and sent them to another detention camp in the island of Cyprus, where my mom was born. And I want you to know that 1948 came, Israel declared statehood, and look what happened. I want you to see this, the the, the picture that is coming right now, and you can see, you can see they came through the sea, they came through the air, and we're bringing the Jewish people from all corners of the world, even up until today. We brought the Ethiopian Jews in a clandestine operation of the Israeli Secret Service and the IDF. We sent El Al planes, 747, without seats. We took all the seats out. We crammed a thousand Ethiopians in one 747. And when it landed, it was a thousand and one because a baby was born. (laughs) Folks, no country ever experienced such a thing in the history of planet Earth. But God said, look, this is all me. I am God. I promised and I fulfill. And so Ezekiel 36 is fulfilled, and Ezekiel 37 is fulfilled, and we are now coming to what is after 37? Oh. So chapter 38 is coming. But chapter 38 is a, in an interesting way. First of all, we see the preparation of the land was fulfilled, we see that the rescue of the remnant was fulfilled. And we see that the return to the land was fulfilled. If I may add, even the revival of the language that was dead for 2,000 years was fulfilled. Because you bring Jews from 80, 90 different countries, how will they communicate? Well, you needed Hebrew. Eliezer ben Yehuda, the Jewish guy that took upon himself the task to revive the Hebrew language. So God revived the land, revived the remnant, brought them physically back, revived the language, and here they are. You know, in the first few years of Israel, Israel was so fragile. Did you know that Israel was so fragile? In the first few years, when David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, summoned all the heads of the intelligence, 1948, he says, guys, we're in trouble. (laughs) Everybody hates us. Everybody wants to destroy us. We have no alliance here with anyone around us. That's not a good thing. Guess who we had alliances with? I tell you, Iran. (laughs) Yes, Iran was our best friend in those years because it wasn't a crazy uh, fundamental uh, Islamic uh, regime there. It was a secular Islamic regime of the Shah, who, by the way, had a house here, if I'm not mistaken, even in Johannesburg. And I want you to know, the other country was Turkey, who was controlled by the religious, uh, excuse me, the secular military uh, uh, group, and Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. All these are the three alliances that Israel had in the first few years. Very interesting. 
And now, the first years Israel fought for its life, 1948, we had only two airplanes. One, you hold the stick, and the other hand, you throw the bomb. <laughs> we have five armored vehicles. And we had soldiers who just survived the Holocaust. They don't even know how to operate a gun. Go to fight. Five Arab nations invaded into Israel. End the local Arabs from within. And we managed not only to survive, but we ended up the 1948 war with 30% more land than when we started. Then came 1956 and 1967 and 1973. And I think by then the world realized Israel is there to remain. And Israel should be like that. <laughs> um, the country in chapter 38 is a country that is safe, secure, and very prosperous. And I want to tell you something, folks. That's the picture of Israel today. From a country that nobody wanted to get near. Today, we are one of the major players in world uh, scene when it comes to technology, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to water, when it comes to military, and when it comes to world affairs. Believe it or not, but when Vladimir Putin wants to have some things said to Donald Trump ahead of the summit in Helsinki, he actually summoned Benjamin Netanyahu to Moscow. Netanyahu is the only world leader that has great relationship with both Putin and Donald Trump. Israel, when it comes to water, Ladies and gentlemen, 87% of our wastewater are undergoing purification and are reused for agriculture. 87%. The next one is 40. <laughs> and it's Spain, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, people flush the toilet and other people are drinking it after, I don't know, a few hours. <laughs> we actually even started, we, we, we are pioneering in disionization uh, facilities. We sold it to all over the world. Uh, I think we need to sell you some. In Port Elizabeth, I think you need some. Um, but we also extract water from the air. Did you know that? We have the technology. You sneeze, we drink. <laughs> energy. Let's go to energy. Israel found trillions in the last five years. Trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. From an unknown player to a major player off the coast of Israel. Look how many. Major player. The minute we announced this, Vladimir Putin was on the first plane. <laughs> and we thought he's landing in Israel to talk about Syria and Iran and the Middle East. When we got the manifest of the passengers, 80 percent of the passengers on that Antonov airplane were actually of the oil and the gas industry. We were shocked. That little KGB guy comes and what do I get from all of this? We told him nothing. <laughs> That's why he's now taking his chances in Syria. You think he came to Syria to save the Syrians from themselves? He came, he actually admitted that. He came to Syria for the spoils. The problem is that most of the oil fields of Syria are east of the Euphrates and the Americans are there right now. And if that's not enough, look at this technology. Israel has the world's highest solar tower when 350 days of your year are sunny. This is the best way to enjoy that energy. What about food? While farm workers made up only 3.7% of the workforce, Israel produced 95% of its own food requirement. That's something amazing. The Israeli cow is the most productive cow in the world. <laughs> yeah. Our cows complain, but deliver. <laughs> Every moo is computerized. Militarily, 
Israel is ranked the number one military in the Middle East. And Israel has the most technologically advanced military on earth. If that's not enough... Technological advantage such as cybersecurity superpower. And that caused a lot of countries to feel very insecure. So Ezekiel in his 38th chapter is introducing to us something very interesting. Now the word of the Lord came to me, says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you. People say, how come my country is not in the Bible? Well, Russia is in the Bible. Because Magog, in the early maps, even when Josephus Flavius wrote about it, Magog was known as the northernmost part above Israel all the way. This is where Russia is today. That's why it's Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. It's not only that. Even the Muslim leaders in the 8th, 9th, and the 10th century always knew that there is somewhere in China the wall of Magog to protect the Chinese from Magog. Amazing. And he's coming all the way, and then he says in in verse 5, Persia will join him. Persia today is Iran. So Russia, the Bible says, as a superpower, is going to lead a military maneuver against God's people. And I don't call Israel God's people. He calls them my people. He says in verse 16, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. And it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? Isn't that interesting that Ezekiel is actually writing about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is speaking about a future event where God will ask Gog, aren't you the guy that Ezekiel spoke about? Wow. 2018. Russia is there. Did you know that on the border of Israel with Syria, there are no Syrians There are no Iranians. There are Russians. According to the last agreement from the last, I don't know, few um, weeks, the Russian military police is not allowing any Iranians or any other people next to the border with Israel. Russia is on the border of Israel today. That's not enough. Last night, or this morning, may I say, do I look like I slept last night? (laughs) Because I didn't. I woke up at 2 a.m. to find out that Israel carried an amazing large-scale attack in Syria. Where even the brother of Bashar al-Assad, who is a general, the head of the 4th Division, of the Syrian army. He was badly wounded. And nearly 70 Iranians were killed. I mean, in Syria, Iranians. And what happened is that the Iranians smuggled North Korean rockets and engines for rockets all the way to a deserted military base in the desert of Iraq and started slowly, slowly bringing those rockets into Damascus. Israel uncovered that plot and the Iranians, you know when you're caught with your hand in the cookie jar, you know? You freeze. They froze. 
and slowly, slowly they turn around and they started taking those same rockets back to Iraq. <laughs> and we've noticed that. So last night or this morning, we took care of business. Israel is not going to allow Iran to entrench itself in Syria because Iran is calling for the annihilation of Israel. The only reason why Iran wants to be in Syria is to annihilate Israel. And they are saying that, by the way. They are saying that. We're not saying that. Ladies and gentlemen, we see all the major players. Iran is there. Turkey. The Bible calls it Gomer and the house of Togarma. That's Turkey of today. Amazing. Rajib Tayyip Erdogan won the last elections and he became not any more prime minister but the Sultan. He built a palace of 1,300 rooms with money that he never had. He built brand new airport with money he never had, bridges with money he never had, tunnels, big projects. He took loans from all the world and now he cannot pay them back. And the Turkish lira is plunging. What five years ago, Turkish lira was two liras for one US dollar, now it's almost seven liras for one US dollar. And he doesn't know what to do. And he's in trouble. And guess what? He blames Israel for it. <laughs> Did you know that the Iranians blame Israel for them not having rain? <laughs> they say, we stole the clouds. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This whole thing is quite interesting. Sudan is mentioned as Kush. And Libya is mentioned as Put. These are the only two African countries that are vowing openly and publicly to destroy Israel. No other African country does it besides these two. Ladies and gentlemen, in the same chapter, Sheba and Dedan is mentioned, and that's Saudi Arabia of today. And they're mentioned as those who criticize the attack. In other words, Saudi Arabia has to swing to the side of Israel somewhere in this whole thing. And guess what? Saudi Arabia today is on Israel's side. I don't know if you know that. Five days ago, the Saudi Minister of Religious Affairs tweets, we were pleased to see that of all countries, Israel allowed its Muslim population to go for a Hajj in Mecca, while other Muslim countries in Yemen, Qatar, did not. More than they hate Israel, they hate each other. And what about Europe? Europe is busy right now committing suicide. Don't interfere. They ask you not to. The Europeans right now are allowing in something that is causing instability and lack of unity in the union. And when that happens, it fits what Daniel says, how the feet are mixed of clay and iron. And if that's not enough, the U.S., although not mentioned in the Bible, could be that when it says of the lions of Tarshish, could be that it, those who came from the loins of the merchants of Tarshish in Europe or England. And Syria is not mentioned here. But Syria is actually where God allowed, by his sovereign way, for all the players to come in preparation for this attack. The Bible says in Isaiah 17, verse 1, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. The Bible says, you know, ever since Damascus was built, it has never been destroyed utterly. So this is a future event and it has to take place. And if you ask me what's next, so many Christians are confused. The Christian Confusion, I call it. Psalm 83, people think it's a future event, but it's not. It's description of the war of independence of Israel, where the, our neighbors came up to destroy us for the name of Israel to be remembered no more. They failed. Isaiah 17, I believe, is the next thing that is going to happen. When Damascus is destroyed, this is exactly when Russia is going to turn against Israel. 
Russia right now is in great terms with Israel. Because Israel is saying to the Russians and to the whole world, we don't mind that Assad stays in power. We prefer him over the Hezbollah or whatever, or some, maybe ISIS. But when Israel will remove the capital, God forbid, maybe because some nuclear tactical weapon might be there, the Russians just said that they are about to put there some tactical nuclear weapon. And it might fall into the wrong hands. You never know. They have enough nuclear, excuse me, biological and chemical over there. If something is going to happen to Damascus, Israel is going to pay. And Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to come to pass. This is, by the way, what Damascus looked like. Take a look at this picture. It's huge. It's not destroyed. And the Bible says it has to be not just destroyed, ruinous heap, uninhabitable. And Jesus said in Luke 21, when you see the beginning of these things, then lift up your heads and look up, for your redemption is drawing near. Ladies and gentlemen, we are already redeemed, so what kind of redemption is he talking about? The redemption, if you read in Romans 8.23, the redemption of our body from this world. Which is, of course, us being taken out of here. And then he says, and when these things already happen, then, the king, then know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Because at the end of all the description of Jesus of the last days, eventually he's coming back with us. And we will reign with him and that's the kingdom of God I don't believe that kingdom now is valid this go outside look that's not the kingdom of God no eye had seen and no ears heard so I believe that we as a generation personally it's my conviction I believe we are the generation that shall not pass before all these things are going to take place. Oh. <laughs> we are the generation. Are we excited or not? Yes. No, you, you, no, listen, when Paul was talking about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he was sure it's going to happen in his lifetime. And he didn't even see half of the things we see. And yet he was excited. How much more we, who witness the greatest move of God since the time of Jesus, when his nation is back in the land, when the land is restored, when it's prosperous once again, when the cloud of war of Ezekiel is about to approach Israel from the north, when we see all of those things, how can we not be excited for the soon return of the Lord to take His beloved church? Amen. Now, I don't set a day and an hour because God doesn't want us to know the day and the hour. Because He knows us. If you know the day and the hour, you set your alarm <laughs> and you go about your own business. And he says, no, you need to be about my business all the time. So when it happens, you will not be caught by a surprise. You will be ready. Here we are, I believe, as Romans 13 says, Do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Although it's not the day. Although it's the night. And we are of the day. We need to walk as in the day. Because the night is far spent. What does it mean the night is far spent? If the night begins here and ends up here, where are we now? 
right here at the end of the night. The day is at hand, he said. Wow, what a challenge to be in a dark world, the light. In a place that is preaching globalism and politically correctness to actually say no. This word is the way, is the truth, and is the life. No one can come to the Father but through Jesus. No one has the privilege of spending eternity with Jesus without first believing in Him. Oh, so what about Israel? The Bible says, that all of Israel will be saved. Wait a minute. You just said that no one enters the kingdom without accepting Jesus. I did say that. Israel will accept him. Yes. When will they accept him? That's the tragic part. Hosea the prophet says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. And through their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Unfortunately, it will take a great trouble or tribulation known as Jacob's trouble to get Israel to finally accept the fact that they are sinners and they must believe in the one who came to give them life and life in abundance. And then the Bible says, look, I'm not making it up. Zechariah the prophet in chapter 12 says, And they look at him whom they pierced, at Jesus. And they will cry. And they will mourn. Because they will repent. Because his feet will stand on Mount of Olives, not in New York City. Not in the tower somewhere. Jesus will return with his saints, with us. And we will reign with him. And Israel then will acknowledge their offense. And they will accept him. The tragic part is that now most of them cannot see it. And they will have to go through a terrible time of tribulation. But throughout even the tribulation, when the world will be led by a man of sin and evil, Israel is going to be protected in the desert where Revelation chapter 12 says for 1260 days, which is exactly three and a half biblical years. A biblical year is a year that is consisted of only 360 days because we are measuring it by the moon, not by the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, everything is there. Even when in Romans 11 he talked about the fact that all Israel will be saved, it says to the people, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. No, 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 excuse me. He says in Romans 11, he says this, concerning the gospel, the Jews now are like enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amazing. So God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for you. And Israel is your insurance policy. That he is a God that is keeping his covenant. And if he called you, by the way, can I see a show of hands of all the perfect people? Oh. See what I'm talking about? 
Even after we have been saved. We are saved by grace and grace alone. It's not of anything that we did. Israel right now is in a time of blindness and disobedience. But the time will come when they will acknowledge their offense. And they will earnestly seek him. And Jesus said to Jerusalem, before he left, he says, Jerusalem, you're not going to see me again until you say, you will invite me. You will say, Baruch haba v'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Israel will have to invite him. And it's only because they will want him. It's only because they will acknowledge their offense. And they will earnestly seek him. And they, he will come. And he will save them. And you will see once again the hand of God for his people. So these are the days of Ezekiel. These are exciting days. And when I see Christians, how are you? Saved by grace. <laughs> well, the joy of the Lord is not your strength. <laughs> Every day, we need to wake up with a huge smile. Perhaps today. <laughs>